Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, this is a very geometric statement, easy to understand. Uh, actually, when I gave a talk about it, somebody came to me and said it was an undergraduate talk. I don't know whether it was a compliment or not. <laughs> uh, so. What is super uniformity? I will talk about two things. One is super uniformity, and one is super duper <laughs> uniformity. I don't know what duper means, but it makes people laugh, so I like to use it. So this is just the plain super. You know, we are in America, so we like to overstate. I like to overstate. So what is super uniformity? It is, uh, I illustrate it on the two-dimensional case where we have a point billiard and uh, it just goes in a deterministic way with the usual law of uh, the in, in angle equals the out angle. And then it is kind of very boring because these are parallel. So there are only two directions due to the fact that these are 90 degrees and if we multiply by four, we get zero. We go back to the start. So, uh, so this is the billiard pass, billiard trajectory which is uniquely determined by the starting point <coughs> and by this angle. Now, there is a classical result which was proved around 100 years ago by, maybe I mentioned four names, Kronecker, Weil, and two, two Hungarians, uh, Such and Koenig. Actually, that was, I guess, the father. Gula. Oh, God, Gula. But, God, I am, because mostly you are combinatorist, I guess, and everybody knows that Danish wrote the first uh, graph theory book. So he's a. But it was proved in 1913. So, so I don't know. It is in the family. Either his <laughs> father. And uh, 1913, and this was done uh, oh, oh, about the same time, that uh, a, perf uh, a perfect characterization of the uniformity of the billiard pass. Billiard pass is uniform if and only if the angle is uh, the slope. is irrational. Uh, so the angle is an irrational multiple of pi. Now, uh, so this is a wonderful result, but uh, it, it doesn't say about the speed of convergence. So uniformity in its weakest form simply means that you take a test set, and actually in uniform distribution, you usually take a very nice test set like a, a subrectangle. X is parallel rectangle, and uh, you measure the time, the billiard pass. So suppose that the billiard pass moves with unit speed one meter per second, then the time equals uh, 
the distance traveled by the billi point billiard. And what you do, you take a test set and you, you take a very large, t well, actually, uh, in an interval, time interval, where t goes from 0 to capital t, you, you measure the time the billiard pass spends in this subset. So pass is in, is in A as uh, t goes from 0 to capital T. And you compare this quantity to the expected value, which is the total time times the area. <coughs> now, uniformity simply means that this difference is little ot. So if we divide by t, the difference I, I mean, then the ratio tends to zero. In a, yeah. And uh, this is where basically stop because this is such a wonderful result that uh, we could characterize exactly the slopes where we get uniformity. And when the slope is rational, then we certainly do not have uniformity because there is some periodic behavior, which is the complete opposite. So this is a wonderful result. But what I noticed about two years ago was that if we weaken this, so instead of studying every single irrational slope, we just go for the majority, then we can have something which is called super uniformity. Now, su what super uniformity means is, is that here we prove square root log t, this upper bound, which is, I mean, this is obviously <laughs> little ot, but this is much smaller than square root t or cube root t or log t, this is square root log t, which, uh, <laughs> which is a very small quantity. I, I have to emphasize that. Well, it's the cubic root of log t. <laughs> I mean, you could do better. It's not, that's, the, that's not very likely. <laughs> that's out of the question. <laughs> now, so, so actually, what is the precise statement? So first, you, you got it right. Actually, that, it, there, there is no log. That is a constant. So super duper absolute constant. Now, but I want, to gi I want to give you a precise statement. And so this is already very surprising. The, the second very surprising part is that unlike in uniform distribution, where we measure uniformity with nice sets and Riemann integrable functions in the worst case scenario. Here I assume that A is arbitrarily ugly. So it is just measurable. So it does have an area. But it can be as ugly as hell. <laughs> so ugly, arbitrarily ugly, it, it doesn't matter. So it is like this. This is A. Yeah, but the problem, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the big problem with ergodic theorem is that uh, that doesn't give any error term. So the punchline here is exactly this. Oh, this is wonderful. This, this classical result and er, ergodic theory, they, they are all wonderful from the qualitative point of view. But for, from the quantitative point of view, when you are interested in how large is the difference, then they don't say anything. And in this general setup, they cannot say anything. So I am not attacking them. All what I am saying that 
this is very, very different because the point is that we can, so here is the precise statement. We start out with an arbitrarily ugly measurable subset. So it does have area, two-dimensional Lebesgue measure. Uh, and what we do, we take a typical billiard trajectory, typical billiard path. B uh, typical means that the starting point and the angle are kind of belong to the 80 percent. You know, this is a product space, the square for starting points and the unit circle for the angles. Take the Cartesian product and the product measure and then for 90 percent of the, so given, given an arbitrarily ugly measurable subset, A. For to that A corresponds a 90 percent, and you give an arbitrarily large T. For example, you give, I don't know, 10 to the, 10 to the 100, which is, a, which is a Google, right? Then for 90 percent of the initial conditions, the pair of starting point and angle, the, the discrepancy, uh, the difference between these enormous numbers. So these are two numbers in the range of 10 to the 100. And the difference is, OK, there is a constant which depends on 90%. This constant is, is 10. So you know, if we take logarithm, that is 100. Square root is 10. 10 times 10 is 100. So it means that the difference between those two gigantic numbers is still less than 100. What I find really amazing, and that's why I call it super uniformity. So this is true for 90% of the initial conditions of the billiard pass. Now, of course, that's right. No, no, that's a very fair question. So for every A, and not just A, I fix T. Because you can ask this natural question. Is it true that the same 90% initial condition works for all T at the same time? And the funny thing, I cannot prove it. Th that is open. What I can prove, and maybe this is the reason why, OK, so when I noticed this, I first I, I saw that that was proved in the 1920s by, I don't know, Hinchin or Erdős. Or, and I couldn't find it. So I talked to a few people. Nobody could point out anything. So maybe you, you find it in the literature. So the way it's kind of doing this, it's like reverse the right hand side. I don't know what is the birth uh, half plus epsilon function to make it uniform in a capital. No, no, I, right no I cannot do that. Maybe you can. I cannot. <laughs> that sounds very logical, that if you weaken it a little bit. So I cannot even prove it to, uh, to make it work for every t, uniformly for every t, with log n to the hundredth power. No. Uh, what I can prove is a little bit ugly CRM, which says that uh, it works for the majority of the t's. So the same 90% of, of the initial conditions is good for the majority of the stopping times, if you like. But OK, so for example, for 90% of the stopping times, it works. But that doesn't mean that it works for every single real number. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what, uh, well, I'm not saying it is a deep result. 
I mean, this it's is the same it, it is the same result. So what I'm saying is what is almost trivial is that it will work for the majority of the T's. But what I cannot prove that it works for every T. But super duper will, will do it. And also, if you ask me another natural question, what about the, OK, we cannot really expect that if, I, if you give me, you don't like me, so, so you give me an ugly A, arbitrarily ugly, then of course I, I cannot expect that I can specify an angle which will work because it, it obviously depends on the ugliness, the complexity of the set. But at least you would say maybe we, could, we should be able to specify the starting point. So why, how come that the starting point is part of the initial condition? Well, this is, this is how I prove it. And uh, so, uh, so another natural question is, what can you prove when the starting point is the center? And then I say, I don't know, nothing, zero. Then I can prove zero for arbitrarily ugly sets. Uh, for nice sets, yes, I can prove log for rectangles. But the punchline here is that the, this is an absolute constant. It, it does not depend on the complexity of A whatsoever. So whatever ugly set you give. Now, of course, you cannot expect that the same trajectory works for every Lubeck measurable set because, uh, you know, the complement of a trajectory is, has measure one. Okay, so this is what I call super uniformity, and I still have, I mean, this is published, but I still have this fear that somebody will send me an email that it was proved in 1935 by, uh, I, I don't know whom. Now, uh, so what is super duper uniformity? Now, super duper uniformity. Well, sure, sure. I was talking to students of Wolfgang Schmidt, and and I know, I was close to him. So whatever he knows, I know it. I mean, that sounds arrogant, but. <laughs> I mean, not in my, I mean, from the literature, that's what I mean. Now, so super, what is super duper uniformity? Super duper, oh, the next natural question is, why is it two-dimensional? What happens in three dimension? Now, in three dimension, unfortunately, the square root log t by the way, it is an open question that I made fun of your cubic root of log t. Maybe you can prove that. Because all that I know is that it, it has to be a constant, which is kind of trivial. It's for the trivial reason that between consecutive integers there is distance one. So it means the lower bound as well. Oh, so the lower bound is obviously, so something like this is obvious. But maybe, so I was very happy with this square root log t. And, uh, but maybe it is cubic, <laughs> cubic root of log t. Maybe it is log log t. Maybe it is less than 100. Not very likely, but it, it is still possible. So is it best possible? I don't know. Uh, OK. Now the next result, super, before I talk about proofs, super duper uniformity, which is about, oh yeah, thank you for bring, bringing me back to the real world. Now here, the error term is unfortunately t to, t to the one fourth times some kind of a log t square root log t or something like that. So what happens, suddenly the error, well, it is still not square root t, which would be kind of the random error, but it jumped up substantially. So this is not super uniformity anymore. 
anymore. I cannot call the three-dimensional case with uh, billiard pair super uniformity, but at least I could prove that this is best possible. So in general, what happens is that the exponent is t to the one half times uh, minus one over two dimension minus one. So I hope I remember well. So let's check it. <laughs> when d is two, then yeah. Okay. So I forgot the. I ignore the square root log t. It is just the t power. And uh, when when d is three, this is one half minus one fourth, which is one fourth. And this is uh, this is correct. So this is sharp. So. Uh, at least I know that. So what it means, it is a little bit disappointing that when the dimension increases, we go back to the good old square root error. You cannot beat square root error in large dimensions, but at least in small dimensions, this is substantially better. OK, so we feel so some disappointment here about, yeah, question. It somehow doesn't make any sense to me that when I, uh, when I give a time t, then, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are really bad angles which are almost rational, very close to rational. They have a small measure. So, so I, I had this finite setup. You see, I, I give you a huge T, and then it doesn't make sense that almost all. Then what makes sense is uh, for 99%. For you mean, yeah, it, it will have to be a function of T. It yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, okay, so this is the result, what I have. Oh, actually, what we have here is uh, area times, uh, there is this extra factor of uh, area E times 1 minus area E. So uh, th this, is, uh, this is here. So for small sets, it, it is small. Okay. And of course, the complement is the same problem. Okay. So, yeah, uh, but, okay. Now, super duper uniformity is about trying to save this, trying to save super uniformity in arbitrary high dimensions. So let's go to the first case when it is not super uniform anymore. That is the three-dimensional case, and then Instead of a, a billiard pass, a one-dimensional straight line, we try a strip. A strip uh, is, is, of course, a long parallelogram in the space. So it has uh, a starting point. And uh, I give two vectors, the direction vectors. So they can be anywhere. So it is in tilted position. And uh, now you can ask the same question, that in the three-dimensional unit cube, we have an arbitrarily ugly measurable test set. This is our A. And what we do. We, well, actually, this time it's, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, it still does make sense that the strip bounces around, right? Or actually, it is almost the same as if I just talk about the torus line. 
Now this is a little technical trick that uh, when you have a because uh, for a uh, for a strip it is not so natural to bounce around but why not i mean a strip can bounce around i mean yeah yeah <laughs> so this is a bill what was it billiard pass now this is a billiard strip does it make sense if you say yes then i I accept it. <laughs> okay. In both uh, directions, so both vectors they are moving. Uh, no, no. Suppose that this is fixed, one of them is fixed and, the other one is, uh, and this is growing. This is going. Right. Why, why are you making it bounce around? Why aren't you just making it periodic and just flow and then reduce it into the fundamental domain? Then you don't have to worry about bouncing. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, it is the same problem. So you, uh, what you are saying is that I can call it torus, torus trip, or or uh, it. It is basically the same as. It just means trip modulo one. And uh, uh, the same question. So when the strip bounces around or just the torus case, when it hits the boundary, it comes back at the opposite side and keeps doing that, then, uh, well, this is just two-dimensional. So it has area. So what we can study is this is a solid, a three-dimensional ugly set, and how much, and the intersection has area. So instead of, uh, so, so the complete analog that uh, we have a strip in A, uh, how much time does the, well, it doesn't make sense how much time it is, what is the area of the intersection, and you compare it to the expected value, which is T times, well, not T, this time the, uh, the area, so for example, if if you stop here, then this is this times that times the sine of the angle, right? Absolute value, I suppose, sine. It's not cosine. It is sine. <laughs> do, do you think of the strip as, as a vertical bar that's, ha that's going through time, or is this actual? It is tilted. Arbitrary, these are arbitrary vectors uh, oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, in the space. Uh, two, two arbitrary vectors, and I just fix one corner of the strip, and then uh, one side is fixed, and the other one increases. So then it just goes out. Like in science fiction, the, the super warriors have this sword where it becomes inf infinitely long. <laughs> so they can kill everybody in the room. <laughs> now, so... So this is a, so everybody understands what a strip is. Now, so the strip cuts up the set. There is an actual intersection. The area is compared to the expected area, which is t times, which is total area times the volume of the set. So for example, if this is 50%, then you expect that it will be 50%. Yes? What is the rule for bouncing off the edge? Like if, if the bottom end of the strip hits, it goes like before this? Then okay, so then it is torus. How about torus? <laughs> torus. Torus thing. Okay, so we take the torus strip, and what is funny here is that this difference, what I call discrepancy discrepancy is less than 100 okay 1000 for 90% of of what of of the 
of the pairs of initial directions. So these are two. It, so uh, these are two unit vectors determining now it's the. Or you have to you have to choose a point also, or now uh, now we have three pairs. Right? Yeah, but the first advantage of this super duper uniformity okay. is that the starting point doesn't matter. Okay. You can have any starting point. It can be the center. It can be anywhere. Okay. Here, I it is. It doesn't matter. So what matters is only the two unit vectors, two points on the unit sphere. So this pair. So, so for 90% of the initial, yeah, how to call this pair of vectors? Give me a good initial directions. Yeah, of the initial directions. Now it seems that the number of parameters, I mean, when you start the proof, it seems the number of parameters may be integrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you have three. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will talk about it. So first of all, the, here the dimension is three. There the dimension was two. And uh, this, uh, the line is one dimensional, of course. Uh, the strip is, of course, two-dimensional. Now, but let me finish. It is important that, so this is how it goes. You don't like me, so you pick for me an, an extremely complicated Lebesgue measurable set in the unit cube. Now, I have to measure the volume. So what I do, I, it doesn't matter where I start my strip. It can start from the origin, from the center. Doesn't matter. What matters is these two vectors. I choose them randomly. They are kind of typical. 90% of them will do this job that uh, it doesn't matter how long this is. It doesn't matter how long that is. So it can be a... It can be like this, it can be like this, it can be like that. <laughs> for all pairs of sizes and for all initial conditions, it is less than 1,000. I think this is surprising. So this, and so this time, it works for all t, actually, pair of t's, because I call this distance t1 and that t2. It doesn't matter what they are, how large they are, and it doesn't matter what the starting point is. But of course, if you ask me, here is A, give me a good, a good pair of directions, then I am clueless. I cannot do that because this is just this kind of measure theoretic proof where I, I, I compute averages. And of course, I don't know uh, which one will work. I don't think. But, but still, I find it very, very surprising. So now let's go to the, to the general question that what, what the heck is going on here? So let's find an intuitive explanation of this. And the intuitive explanation is this, that if we have the d-dimensional cube, unit cube, and uh, we have a, a k-dimensional strip. So an ordinary, you know what I mean by k-dimensional strip. It is a k-dimension. OK, so a k minus 1 dimensions are fixed, and 1 is uh, growing. Then it is kind of a, what the heck is that? I don't know. My English is limited. But tube, tube. Uh, what my grandmother knows. My grandmother doesn't know sector, but. OK. <laughs> OK, strip, strip. Then 
This is what we have. At the core of the proof, we have this very trivial fact that we have a subset A, and we consider the, the Fourier series of the characteristic function. Now, uh, the characteristic function of A has a Fourier series like A sub, I don't know, R is a vector in the d-dimensional uh, space, and we take e to the 2 pi i, uh, the most standard Fourier r. Uh, OK, yeah, this is a function of a variable, I don't know, u. And we have the dot product, and uh, this is it. This is a Fourier series. And these are the Fourier coefficients. Now, it turns out that we can express, so this is basically just an exercise from Fourier series. The most surprising part is that nobody did this. Now, when there is a point where I oversimplify, but something like this comes up. When this is d and that is k, then we have ar over r to the k's power. And r runs over the non-zero lattice points in the d-dimensional space. So this is kind of what I call a critical, critical sum. Now the, the situation is more complicated than that. But in the most primitive level, first we have to decide whether this is convergent or divergent. It is more complicated, but this is the first, first approximation. Now, of course, what I mean by that is the Euclidean lengths of a vector. So k, k, uh, k, uh, k is 1 for lines, k is 2 for, for strips, and it actually can be generalized for arbitrary dimension. Now, uh, when you are out of ideas in Fourier series, then you apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. <laughs> And it gives you this that we have the, the sum over the lattice points, square root, times the, the sum of the uh, squares of the, no, uh, the two case powers of the norms. Again, the same summation. And uh, well, the good news is that this is, of course, uh, uh, finite by pa Parseval's formula. Actually, it is nothing else than volume of A times uh, the volume of the complement, because the constant is out. And so this is, let me write, less than 1. A and uh, what about this? Well, this is a trivial calculation that at a large distance of, uh, of distance, like 2 to, the, 2 to the n, we have how many lattice points in the d-dimensional space? Oh, no, uh, uh, sorry, I cannot use d. So at distance two, 2 to the n, there are 2 to the n to the d lattice points. And uh, so what we have here is uh, 2 to the n to the 2k. And of course, what is this? This is 2 to the negative n uh, raised to the uh, 2k minus d. And uh, if they are fixed, then of course, when this is, uh, this is positive, so 2k is greater than d, then this is convergent. So what I am doing is uh, absolute triviality, counting lattice points. The number of lattice points in a large ball is uh, the dimensions power of the radius. Now, so in that case, we have convergence. And that means we have super duper uniformity. So We're using it as a characteristic yeah. function. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it can be, but that's what I like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it looks, I mean, you can draw a set. You cannot draw a function. <laughs> so I am a geometer. So Now, but you are right. Now, OK, so, and so, so what happens in the case when? Well, at least it shows that your methods are L2 methods. Oh, that's right. Oh, I am not doing anything sophisticated. I am using the simplest uh, Parseval formula. Now, the only trick what I do is that actually I use the, the method of uh, small denominators, which means that I kind of s throw away bad angles. So to, to explain it a little bit better, that, uh, for example, how does the proof of this surprising result go? Now, what we actually have to study is, uh, is this, that let me give name to these. These are two unit vectors just indicating the directions. So V1 and V2, they are unit vectors. So what we have, so it doesn't, ma and, and, and this length is, I don't know, T2, and that length is T1. So they are, they are arbitrary. Now then, instead of this square, uh, this is what we, what we have. We have uh, v1 dot r and v2 dot r. And we are in this three-dimensional case. So then, actually, the truth is that this is an upper bound on the discrepancy. And this is what we have to handle. And we want to show that this is, this is less than a constant. Now, uh, you have to lower bound T1, right? V1 cannot be too big, so can, I mean, cannot be too small. No, you, have to lower bound right as a you are a geometer. That is misleading you. Yeah, I saw the same thing until I finished the calculations and I came to the conclusion it doesn't matter. It is counterintuitive for a geometer. But if you go through, but for an algebraist, <laughs> okay, try to be an algebraist. It is not easy. <laughs> No, 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 no. The strip intersects the complicated three-dimensional set, and that the that has a two-dimension that has area. And you compare. Okay, suppose that the ugly set is is half of the unit cube, so it has volume one half. Then you compare this actual intersection area with uh, one half times the area of the whole strip. Oh, I see. So, so that's why. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I call the, the discrepancy. Right. So that's the. Right. It does not. There's no need for lower bound. Very good. Now, so if you carry out the ugly calculations, this is what you face. Now, well, at least this is an upper bound, and it is actually, you have to be a little bit brave to, to do this upper bound because this is a clumsy upper bound, actually. But the punchline is that this is enough. So the, the, my greatest achievement was to be brave enough. <laughs> and so, but this is a little bit more complicated than that because, look, Whenever you have a pair of vectors, v, v1 and v2, like this is actually there, uh, this is v1, then there are many lattice points which are almost perpendicular. 
you know, this is extended over all lattice points. So whatever vector you have, there are lattice points which are almost perpendicular, infinitely many. So there are kind of, which, which leads to small denominators. You see, in the previous estimations, I just said these are unit vectors. So of course, it, it, is, an, it is a lower bound if I just write this and I write this. Now how to put it? A larger denominator gives a lower bond, which is useless for me, but this is trivial to compute. Now what we actually have, we need an upper bond, is, is this. And uh, I mean, this is high school stuff. This is high school stuff. So there are bad, bad lattice points. There are lattice points which are almost perpendicular to a given vector or, or to the other. But this is what we do. We, we throw away bad directions. So I call a direction very bad if uh, like uh, V1 times R multiplied by V2 times R is less than 1 over R to the fourth. So this is a, so given a pair of directions, I call a lattice point non-zero lattice point bad if this happens. So if this product is very, very small, okay, here I write some epsilon because there I had, you know, this is one minus epsilon, right? So there is a small constant. And uh, you can easily check, okay, so that the total measure, you can assume that this never happens for 90%. Because it is easy to, uh, to see the geometric meaning of this. So for every single lattice point, you take, uh, this is a vector, those pairs which are bad with respect to them. Uh, uh, for example, if this is very, if this factor is small, that means it is in the, it is in this strip. You know, the lattice point is in this, uh, it is a, a spherical belt. And you can compute the, su the surface area. And it is a very small, very small because this is already very small. And uh, so even if you add up for all lattice points, that's why I have uh, a large power. This is greater than, than three, and we are in this three-dimensional space. So there are kind of cubically many uh, lattice points. It is still convergent, and by choosing this epsilon, you can guarantee that this is, uh, this is just epsilon part, or maybe 10 epsilon part of the whole whole set of uh, pairs of directions. Now, when you do this, so you, you exclude the really bad denominators, so you cannot have really bad denominators, then you can, uh, you can estimate this from above, not by uh, simply writing uh, uh, this, but you kind of sacrifice, you get kind of a log r squared, an extra factor. So this is the only idea, that I, I throw away the bad directions, the bad pairs of directions, which means that this is always true for every lattice point. In that case, we can handle this 
by Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and estimations. And this is still okay because uh, because the only uh, because it just makes when you square it it will be like four minus epsilon. But four minus epsilon is still greater than three, which is the dimension, and that is how the the lattice points grow in a cubic fashion. So what I am saying is that the technical details are Fourier series, Parseval formula, and Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and throwing out the bad directions, which means that you cannot really have very bad, very small denominators. And then it's just estimations. OK, it is still something like seven or eight pages. So the technicalities are kind of annoying, but every step is high school. OK, not high school, but I mean first year graduate course level. And uh, so everybody could do that if you have the, if you, if you guess that it will work. So, and the same thing with, now, in the one-dimensional case, it is different. There, unfortunately, I immediately have to apply the, the Parseval formula for taking average over all initial conditions. Here, in the case of super-duper, I don't do that. That's why it doesn't matter what the starting point is. So the strip can grow out from any point. But there, I take, first I apply a Parseval formula, which is, again, the simplest. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, that is the most important elementary theorem in Fourier ser series. So, but this is what he, we have in the two-dimensional case that the, we apply Parseval formula and we end up with this, that the L2 norm, so discrepancy squared average, I put integration. So this is literally equals an expression like this where v1 is, is the direction vector. This is v1. Just, and this is squared. Now again, why do we have a chance for this? To show that, well, actually, I cheat. And I will prove that this is a constant. My cheating is that I am saying that this is a unit vector. So 1 times r is r. It is r squared. OK. So that was a cheating. You understand? I cheated. Because this is a lower bond. <laughs> but uh, I cheated here. But now it is trivial. Because now we apply Cauchy-Schwarz. And we get actually the force powers under square root times the the uh, one over r to the force over the non-zero lattice points under square root. And of course, this is less than, I mean, even if I write 2 squared, that is an upper bond. And this is uh, bonded. And this is also bonded. I mean, it is bonded even for, for the third power. So it seems like I have a chance for, for super duper uniformity, except that I immediately took average over the initial, the starting points. So I, it will be just about typical starting points because I already lost control about individual starting points. But it is still, it would be nice to have a constant. But when I cheated here, that was a, a big fat cheating, not a minor cheating. 
And uh, it can really happen that given any direction vector, of course, there are lattice points which are almost perpendicular. And not just that, here we have a square. So if this is small, it is small squared. And uh, therefore, again, you have to throw out bad directions. Here, bad direction simply means that uh, uh, given any direction vector, uh, no, a direction vector is bad if there exists a lattice point, non-zero lattice point, such that V1 times R, I mean the dot product, times R to R, uh, R times log, log R to the 1 plus epsilon is, uh, is less than epsilon. Now, this is, so a direction is bad if there exists a lattice, po a non-zero lattice point on the plane such that this happens. Now, if I throw out for, for every lattice point, I take the corresponding angles. That is a small arc on the unit circle. Even if I add this up for all lattice points, I get a convergent series because it is you know, it is like 1 over R n times log n to the 1 plus epsilon. You know, this is still convergent. And uh, actually, I can even write here, now I am telling you the truth, I can write here log log, log log R to the 1 plus epsilon. And uh, I cheated here because because of this, we do have a log log t to the one half plus epsilon there, but I just I said that would be too much for you. But now uh, I admit that that is missing. But I am kind of a half computer scientist. I mean a tiny half. One, <laughs> I would say one percent, and the computer science log log is. Is, is two. Oh, no, it's two ten to six. No. It depends your it depends on the size. No. For some computer science, this is the biggest function that we've seen. Oh, yeah. No, log, log. Oh, it's huge. Yeah, if you talk about <laughs> human size, I mean, a minimum size. In person, I feel like, now that's beginning to be small. Log, <laughs> log. <laughs> okay, then my teachers were bad. I, I, I. Okay, so I, this is less than five. <laughs> for me. Okay. Anyway, I, I apologize if I insulted anybody. <laughs> now, so, so this is what we s throw away. That guarantees that this cannot be really bad, but here it is re for some reason a two-page or three-page calculation to get that. And you, you don't want to see it because it is just cauchy Schwartz and uh, and and that kind of stuff. So this is about seven, eight pages. That is about seven, eight pages. And uh, so the proof is not, there is nothing really interesting in it, except kind of throwing away the, the bad angles, which, which is a standard technique. It is the so-called deletion, deletion method in, uh, in, in the probabilist, in, in the Erdős combinatorics. And, it is called the small, de de small denominator, the problem with small denominators in, in differential equations. And, uh, and apart from that, I am done. Okay. okay.